always appreciate the uh, level of support that you guys uh, provide us with the work that we do. Uh, we won't get a lot of the messages that we need to get out there without your assistance, so thank you very much for coming in. Greatly appreciated. Uh, the media release today re relates specifically to a number of arrests that have happened in the last week. Uh, from the outset, I'll just indicate, as I, I spoke to you before the press release today, that these are largely unrelated matters. They've just all come to a conclusion at, at a very similar uh, period of time. Just holistically, I'll, I'll give you some indication of what they relate to, and your, your press release will have some details about the individuals in there. But uh, of the targets that we've arrested this week, uh, largely they were self-generated by detectives at Task Force Argos uh, online, either infiltrating or monitoring social networking media or proactively targeting offenders that distribute child exploitation material across the internet. Several of the referrals came in from Washington DC from the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children. That relates, both of those cases relate to the upload of child exploitation material onto the internet. That's then referred to us for investigation. One of the referrals came from the South Australian Police who uh, we had the, uh, the great honour of training last year. Their online operatives uh, were posing online as a 12 and a 14 year old child and a Queenslander targeted both of those entities and that was referred to us. And the last one which is probably the catalyst for us having a talk to you today relates to a real child who was on a social networking account and was uh, fairly aggressively groomed by a child sex offender. Now the entity that that child sex offender utilised online was he was posing as a 13 year old girl. Uh, the offender had a number of photographs of the, the same child, had set up his social networking account with a number of photographs of the same child and in chat on the social networking account progressively and fairly aggressively switched the conversation to a, a sexualised context and then uh, endeavoured to get the child to send photographs of herself back to the offender by firstly sending photos of himself. Okay? or what he was purporting to be himself. Now, one of the things that I can tell you out of that is that if children on the internet do not lock down their social networking accounts and make all of their photographs publicly available, offenders like this individual will harvest them and store them and then set up false entities, which is what happened in this instance. Now, I've read the chat logs that relate to that particular engagement. Extremely concerning. Also what was concerning was the fact that the child's social networking account was openly accessible. Now our message out of this is that a lot of the, the threats and dangers that uh, children face on the internet could be stopped at the front line by parents. If they take a, a moment, a, a bit of interest in what their children are doing on the internet, sit down with them and have a look at the accounts that they've set up and make sure that the security protocols that are largely provided by industry service providers are enacted, we won't have this problem. Uh, so in this particular instance, this child was, well, the offender was targeting multiple, literally hundreds of Queensland children, sp spamming them, if you like, with friend requests. Uh, the captures of the engagements that we managed to get clearly indicate that a lot of the children are net savvy, because most of them were saying, who are you, I don't know you, uh, which is a really good response. But it also indicates quite clearly that their accounts were open and accessible to this offender. So uh, that gives you a brief overview of the, of the warrant executions that have happened in this last week. We do this day in, day out, every year. Uh, it's just core business. We've been doing it for a long time, as indicated in the press release. Operation Bow has been going for 11 years now. It was set up to proactively target child sex offenders on the internet. Um, it's, uh, it's been, I would say, largely very, a very successful operation, but the simple reality is, is that we are not going to prosecute ourselves out of the problem that we face with internet child sex offenders and public awareness uh, and tools like the, uh, the police generated, the Queensland police generated who's chatting to your kids are the kind of tools that we need to get out there to parents. If parents have problem talking to their children, if they're not uh, geeky enough, uh, for want of a better term, and are unable to talk at the same level as their very net savvy children, at the backlet of the booklet is actually a family internet safety agreement. That lists off a number of things that you as a parent 
really should talk to your kids about and get some kind of a, an agreement on before you go any further forward. Is that, let's face it, at the end of the day, the person that's providing these kids with 3G phones, um, laptops, PCs, tablets, is mum and dad. And what they're giving them is a means of communication with the world. If you don't arm them with some information about how to protect themselves, then we're going to continue to see the kind of problems that we face at Task Force Argos. Can I just yes. clarify the, the offender you were talking about, the spam of these hundreds of twenty black children? Yeah. Did he, I guess, access photos of a child from online that were open, protected, and then use them to pose? That's absolutely correct. When we executed the search warrant, there was no identifiable risk to any child that we could determine no access to any child. That's one of our primary concerns. But in this case, as I indicated, he's harvested open source images. And what they'll do is they'll actually try to get a series of images, whether the child is at school, playground, with friends, at parties. And that just helps to bolster their online identity and s satisfy the child that they're dealing with a real person. So the children he was targeting thought that he was a 13-year-old girl? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the, the nature of his conversation with, particularly in this case, and this is always concerning when we deal with a real child victim, uh, this happens all the time, it's not just detectives online pretending to be kids, uh, it becomes most concerning when we see very, very sexualised engagement with a young child, and obviously this caused a great deal of alarm for her parents. Yeah, well, this is really going to come down to your relationship with your child and what you're prepared to allow them to do. Most parents would, will, you know, if their child's old enough, leave them home while they go to work or, or whatever they need to do. But uh, look, as I said, my, my daughter is, uh, is a net citizen, like most of the kids of this generation. Uh, you take away their mobile phone uh, or their computer and you make them a social recluse. So... Yeah, if you leave your child at home unsupervised, they will be online, they will be talking, hopefully, largely to their friends, but you need to be fully aware that there are other people out there that have a vested interest in trying to gain the friendship of your child, and not for the reasons that you would like. What advice would you give to parents, and there's a case in South Australia that you're probably familiar with, the Carly Ryan murder, and in that case, Carly was on MySpace chatting to a man who was posing as a teenage boy, and her mother found out that this was happening, and confiscated all of her And she still found a way to, to get on there. Yeah. But what about parents who, who try all of this and their kids are still determined to get on there? Yeah, look, look the, taking the technology away from the child is not the solution. You know, as I said, that, that makes them a social recluse and will drive them to find other ways to get back in touch with people. There's probably two messages there. Number one, uh, from a parental perspective, if you're going to do anything, then you really should take the time to sit down and have a look at who their online friends are. So if they've got... 7,000 friends on MSN or whatever other application is, I'd probably take a few minutes to sit down and go, do you really know all of these people? And if you don't, then how did you come to know them and how do you know that they are really who they are saying that they are? Uh, so that would be number one. You know, Time spent talking to somebody online does not equate to friendship. Uh, so that's first message. Familiarise yourself with who your child's friends are online. Make sure that you're familiar with the technology that they're using. So if they're using a particular social networking platform, I'd encourage you to set up an account in that social networking platform so you can get yourself across how it's used and what technology can be used to protect your child. Uh, the third thing there is taking, as I said, taking that technology away isn't the solution. You, I would suggest that you're far better poised to sit down and make sure that they're prepared to come and talk to you if there is a problem. So yeah. you said that um, it was through undercover police posing as children themselves that actually led to the arrest of two people, is that right? Uh, yeah. T two of the Queenslanders uh, were arrested as a result of proactive online engagement by detectives from Task Force Argos. One of the offenders was a referral from the South Australian Police Online team. So three of the offenders were actively and openly engaging what they thought, we will be alleging, what they thought were children. And in this case, obviously, it was, uh, it was police officers. And so just to clarify, um, some people were only arrested just for possessing child pornography, not doing this online engagement sort of thing. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So several of the referrals that came in specifically related to offenders uploading, distributing 
child exploitation material across the internet. Now, whether that's through a peer-to-peer uh, -peer application or whether it was loaded into some of the online storage sites, uh, in fact, in both cases, all three of the cases where we've had a distribution or possession charge, it relates to those uh, tools that they've used. So all up four people basically charged over the grooming offences? Uh, let me just have a quick look at the... Yeah, well, we had the, the real child was the first one, which is obviously the most concerning one that happened earlier in the week, and then the three further ones that were us actually proactively engaging, not reactively. No, we fortunately, uh, the parents advised us of what was going on and we, we managed to intercede before it would get to that level. Uh, I can tell you for a fact that in the, uh, I think now the 11 years that I, I've been working in this crime type, there have been multiple incidents where children have turned up and met offenders and have been sexually abused. It, it comes with a couple of problems. The, um, and it probably comes back a little bit to your question um, about how you deal with this. Uh, in those instances that we've had to deal with, the children have been either too embarrassed or too scared to tell their parents what happened, um, which is obviously quite sad and, and tragic. Uh, and the other thing is too that we're finding is that if, if you don't have that kind of a relationship with your child that's fairly open and trusting, they won't tell you what's happening. Um, and largely that may be out of fear that you're going to take the technology away from them. So it just comes back to that point that we just encourage people to be good parents be the frontline defence uh, that we need you to be. Be the firewall between the offender and your home. Uh, the, the social networking sites that we are dealing with and the way that we're seeing offenders deal with those sites, they're treating them largely like a shopping mall, okay, like a supermarket to locate victims. So the role of the parent is to make sure that the product is not available and that is their child. Okay? Yeah, look, it's, um, it shouldn't be rocket science that uh, offenders will go where children are. And there's lots of freely available online games, uh, and I'm not going to name any of them specifically, but there are a lot that have been going for quite a long time. Some are more attractive to boys, some are more attractive to girls, some are very, you know, to very, very young children. Um, the rules that we're talking about here go across that kind of medium as well. If you're going to go into those kind of spaces where you're interacting with um, avatars and 3D uh, entities that have been created by other people, you don't know what you are dealing with. You don't know if it is an offender that's set up one of these accounts particularly to engage your child, and we are seeing that that does happen. So the same rules that we're talking about in terms of social networking or instant messaging or VoIP or any of the other applications that are used to communicate online apply to online games as well. But particularly the main thing I would say is never ever Make sure that your child never, ever arranges a meeting with somebody that they've met online. And we have seen that happen, and as I said before, we have seen children sexually abused as a result of that. And just to clarify, in the case of the 13-year-old, um, how close did it get to, to there being a meeting? Uh, look, the, the discussion hadn't gone into the point of them getting together uh, in the real world, but I can tell you, and will allege, that the, uh, the communication was very, very indicative that this 13-year-old... Uh, child wanted to introduce the younger child to an adult and I would be alleging that that adult was the offender. Okay. Inspector, when these sexually explicit photos get onto the internet, what happens to them? How do you mean, sorry? Well, no. uh, a predator obtains these photos and yeah. the child to submit them to them. Yeah. What happens to them then? Do you lose complete control of whatever happens to that photo? Oh, you're talking about if you post a picture yourself? Yeah. That you've created, yeah. One of these photos, where does it go and where does it end? If you put it on the internet, you've lost control of it. That, it's as simple as that. And you don't know who then has it or who is distributing it or who is using it for their own means. So it, it really comes back down again if you're using social networking and people post literally uh, millions of images every day to social networking accounts. If they're at the races or out at a restaurant or whatever else. You put it onto social media, you've lost control of it. Uh, anybody who has access to your account can download it and use it for their own means. So it really all comes back to that same message again about being aware of the information you put on the internet 
another valuable point here too, actually, while I'm on that is whilst we're encouraging, encouraging parents to make sure their kids are locking down their accounts, be very careful about what information they're putting on in terms of who they are. Full names, dates of birth, schools, we see this every day in investigations. It really helps an offender narrow down their focus in terms of their victim. But if they do those things and then they post several images of themselves with their school friends, well, then we have an identifiable school uniform that the offender can use. Geographic locations can be identified from all of that information. So, yeah, look, accept the fact that if you put it online, you've lost control of it. Uh, surprised, no. Disappointed, yes. Uh, but the reality is if you, as a journalist, if you go back and you have a look at any of the social networking platforms and you search, there's a couple of uh, social networking sites that we would really encourage people not to use because they can search in a very geographically specific manner and by age. The number of overtly sexualised images that kids put online is really quite concerning. Um, largely what we'll see is self-taken photographs with um, a 3G phone uh, in a, let's say, a, uh, an angle or in a manner that is very sexually provocative. Um, and so in answer to your question, am I surprised? No, but I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, but I am disappointed that that happens. And I guess the question really begs, uh, are the parents looking at that online account? Have they assessed what their child has put online and would they approve of that? And I'd probably argue no. Oh, it's, it's really quite variable. Uh, look, over the years that we've been doing this work, uh, the, the volume of a child sex offenders collection has increased quite significantly. Uh, a lot of that now is video, so you know, storage is now quite cheap. You can buy a terabyte for under $100, $100 now, whereas a terabyte 10 years ago wasn't even conceivable. So the, the volume that is now accessible to uh, the people that want to collect this kind of material is huge. So for our detectives, obviously, that, that creates a fairly significant challenge in going through the material and trying to identify victims. Uh, it's escalating. Um, in these, the arrests this week, we didn't come across anything in terms of enormously large volumes of material that was concerning. But that wasn't really what we were proactively targeting this week. Look, uh, and Amanda, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, we progressively moved away from naming the kinds of occupations. And look, the reason for that is, is it, it, it's just meaningless information. They are all walks of life. Um, they are, over the years, I've seen everything from, and not in this instance, but I've seen everything from people who pack shelves, who do children's crossings, to uh, police officers, to doctors, lawyers, it's all walks of life. So in this instance, what I will tell you is that there was no occupation there that had open or easy access to a child. That's one of our prime concerns when we're doing these, this kind of work is we'll look at whether they are a parent, whether they have access to children, and if their occupation actually puts them in a position where they could, uh, through some empowerment in the position that they hold, have access to a child. Oh, uh, look, we had a mix of married and single men. Which is not unusual, too. I can tell you in the time that we've been doing this, uh, there's a lot of instances where we arrest married men with children. Were any of these men? No, they weren't parents, but uh, several of them were married. Just in relation to that question about occupations, surely if these are people that hold positions of responsibility, the public needs to know that. If they held positions of responsibility, I can assure you that we would have acted in that, in that manner to make sure that that was rectified. None of, the, none of the occupations that were held from any of these people should hold any particular concern for anybody. So in saying that, if we were dealing with, say, for example, a police officer or a teacher or some, a blue card holder, we would make sure that the appropriate authorities there were acting in a capacity to make sure that that risk was reduced or actually removed. None of them were like junior sports coaches or anything like that? No, absolutely not. Look, just um, if you do get to do your plug at the end, 